for thee. Let's play ball. Let's play ball. I don't know if the other speakers rate those. That, that wasn't so bad. Let the doors be open, Con ouvre les portes. Statements by members. Déclaration du député, the honorable member for Etobicoke North. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to recognize Candace Coachpaw, who has been honored by the top 25 women of influence and the top 100 accomplished black Canadian women. Candace is an inspiring leader who believes in giving youth opportunities that did not exist for her and in nurturing the tremendous talent that exists in the black community. Candace created the organization Developing Young Leaders of Tomorrow to provide education, training, and mentorship for black youth. She also created Lead Like a Girl and the Black Diplomats Academy to give black youth the opportunity to meet government, business, and international affairs leaders to make connections and get experience. Young leaders from her organizations are already making their mark, attending COP26 in Glasgow and interning in government departments. Please join me in recognizing Candace Coachpaw and the extraordinary youth who are already making our community and country a better place. The Honourable Member for Simcoe Gray. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I rise today to invite all Canadians to the inaugural Blue Mountain Film Fest taking place June 1st to June 5th in the town of Blue Mountains. The festival will include over 20 international and Canadian films, an industry creative forum and social events, all set in beautiful Blue Mountain villages on the shore of Georgian Bay. Nice. I want to give a special thanks to the great team behind this initiative. Patty Kendall and Marty Morrow, whose idea to create a film fest got the ball rolling. Executive Director Helen Dutois and Core Director of Film Programming Diana Sanchez, who each bring a wealth of experience from international film festivals. And the incredible advisory team, Daniel Beckerman, Allison Black, Drew Fagan, Jennifer Fries, Tamara Podemski, John Raykich, Sud Sutherland, <coughs> Stephanie Ozim, and Tara Woodbury. Thank you, Mayor Soever, Blue Mountain Council, and Andrew Sigward of Blue Mountain Village for their dedication to furthering economic development in our region. Happy Film Fest. Here, here. Yeah. The Honourable Member for St. Catharines. The Ukrainian community has significant roots in St. Catharines. For generations, the community has preserved a sense of culture and identity, understanding that the history of Ukraine is riddled with instances of Soviet and Russian attempts to destroy it. When Vladimir Putin began his illegal war in Ukraine, St. Catherine's residents, along with the Ukrainian community, stood up to do whatever they could. The outpouring of support continues to grow, with many wanting to assist however they can. St. John's Ukrainian Catholic Church has been filled with needed supplies, and more than 1,000 boxes are currently en route to Ukraine. For those who would like to still assist, monetary donations are needed as the cost of shipping goods is high. Donations can be made in person or online at the church's website. I'd like to thank all the volunteers and residents during this difficult time, and I'd like to highlight Irene Newton for her work not only during this crisis, but always ensuring that the voice of Ukraine and the Ukrainian-Canadian community is heard in St. Catharines. Slava Ukraini. The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, today I wish to highlight Quebec's Intellectual Disability Week, which is now underway from March 20th to 26th. This year's campaign theme is focused on making prejudices a thing of the past. It's a reminder that we still need, even today, to fight the prejudices that those with intellectual disabilities must face every day. What can we do? Well, we must ensure that they have every means necessary in place to facilitate their inclusion and we need to make sure that their families and support networks have the tools and help they need. I would like to conclude by congratulating the Quebec Intellectual Disability Society, which is marking its 70th anniversary this year. Your work is extraordinary and necessary. From the bottom of my heart, thank you. The Honourable Member for Brampton Centre. Mr. Speaker, 82 years ago today, on March 23rd, 1940, thousands of Muslims from all over the Indian subcontinent gathered in Lahore. They had one dream, one vision, and one mission, 
A resolution was passed calling for the creation of a separate homeland for Muslims in British India. Exactly 16 years later, on March 23, 1956, Pakistan adopted its first constitution during the transition of the dominion of the Pakistan to the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, making Pakistan the world's first Islamic Republic. Pakistan Day, or Pakistan Resolution Day, also known as a Republic Day, is a public holiday celebrated annually in Mar on March 23rd in Pakistan and by the Pakistani diaspora around the world. I invite all members of this House and all Canadians who join in congratulating the people of Pakistan on the celebration of these two seminal dates in the celebration and the creation of Pakistan. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Mission Masquerie, Fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to stand here today to congratulate one of my constituents upon her retirement at the end of March, Deborah Arnott. As a strong First Nation leader with deep roots in the Fraser Canyon, for the last 30 years, Deborah has been serving the region as General Manager of Community Futures Sun Country. Throughout her tenure, her passion and business acumen bolstered local entrepreneurs and helped them to build up economic development in the Fraser Canyon. I am sure the many businesses in Cash Creek, Ashcroft, Lytton and Lillooet and surrounding First Nations will join me in thanking Deb for her years of service, the relationships she fostered and her endless support for the region. She is a force in our community and will be greatly missed. Thank you, Deborah, for all of your hard work seeing businesses through some of the greatest crises our, our, we have ever faced, including the Elephant Hill wildfire, the global pandemic, Lytton wildfires, and major floods. Congratulations on your very well-deserved retirement, and I wish you all the best of successes moving forward. The Honourable Member for Surrey Centre. On February 24, 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine. Millions began to be displaced, thousands killed, and people's lives turned upside down. But Canadians rolled up their sleeves and opened their hearts. In my hometown of Surrey, I received a call from our local community activist, philanthropist, and doctor, Dr. Gozar Singh Chima, saying the community wants to help. Quickly, Kalinder Sangera of Red FM and Bill Sandhu of Sanja TV stepped up and cons consulted with Al Alex of the Canada-Ukraine Foundation and on March 7th did a radio and telethon raising over $300,000 in less than eight hours. Special thanks to all my colleagues in this House uh, who cross party lines, called, donated and encouraged Canadians to donate. And also to Jadi Sidhu and all the volunteers from Red FM, Sanja TV, and Canada UN U Ukraine Foundation and, uh, who attended calls, processed donations. My huge gratitude to the people of Surrey for stepping up. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Newmarket Aurora. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today to recognize three young brothers in my riding of Newmarket Aurora Jake, Nathan, and Owen for their compassion and their desire to make a positive difference. Mr. Speaker, I'm wearing one of their Buttons for Ukraine, which they designed and produced to seek donations. In just two weeks, they raised over $8,000 with donations being made directly to the Canadian Red Cross to support their relief efforts. There's no price on these buttons, but people are encouraged to donate what they can in order to receive a button. Jake, Nathan, and Owen have asked that these buttons be worn until the war is over in order to honor the sacrifices and the courage of the Ukrainian people. The young, these young lads can be reached on Twitter at buttons for ukraine or if any of my colleagues would like any further information, please reach out to my office. Mr. Speaker, these young Canadians never fail to inspire me. Our future in Canada is bright. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker, the cost of living continues to be a gut punch to my constituents in Brantford Brant and all hardworking Canadians. Food costs are up 7.4%, gasoline 32.3% in just one year. The housing affordability crisis has become even worse with the biggest month-over-month -month hike since April of 83. 
To add insult to injury, the new NDP Liberal government is pushing ahead with several tax hikes, including the carbon tax. And what does the NDP Prime Minister have to say to the elderly, young parents and other many others in my riding? They don't want to hear the old speaking points about Canada's recovery and our credit rating. They need immediate relief now. Instead, Canadians can expect new unprecedented expenses from the NDP Liberal government that will drive inflation even higher. What nonsense and how irresponsible. Mr. Speaker, it is time for this NDP Prime Minister to stop punishing hardworking families and start making the decisions with fiscal responsibility. Thank you. The Honourable Member for London West. Quality affordable housing helps create a stable environment for children by reducing frequent family moves, stability and well-being of families. I am proud to see the many investments happening across the country to continue to address housing needs. I want to highlight a good story in my riding of London West where a recent opening of 61 units housing built to, uh, took place. Thanks to the $7.5 million investment from the Government of Canada's Rapid Housing Initiative, in partnership with the St. Leonard's Community Services, the units will house families and youth that were uh, either experiencing homelessness or that were in shelters. Indigenous people, individuals coming from domestic abuse, as well as individuals that have been in emergency shelter in, or in winter response sites. The Rapid Housing Initiative in its quest is to help communities in London and across Canada and is building back better by creating more jobs in the construction and housing sectors, which grows the middle class and gets closer to eliminating chronic homelessness in Canada. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Chatham, Kent, Bloomington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In many ways, Ukraine is us and we are Ukraine. Canada has the largest Ukrainian community outside of Ukraine and Russia. We are one in our opposition to illegal invasions, one in our shared value that democracy and freedom best serve a country's citizens. We shouldn't describe what's happening there as a war, because a war implies two aggressors. Russia alone has illegally invaded Ukraine, and in so doing, jeopardized Ukraine's ability to produce food, and Russia's ability to export food because of sanctions rightfully imposed. As someone very familiar with agriculture and agri-food, Ukraine and Russia's agricultural community and their systems account for 30% of the exports of the world's wheat, 17% of corn, 32% of barley, and 75% of the world's sunflower cooking oil. If we lose Ukraine, we lose one of our best chances to preserve world order against an escalating torrent of destructive madness. Slava Ukraini. The Honourable Member for Battleford is Lloyd Minster. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Canadians are being hit with the highest inflation rate in a generation, and costs are skyrocketing. Wages are not keeping up, and it's getting harder and harder to make ends meet. From the cost of gas, groceries, and to everything else, the scheduled carbon tax on April 1st will only exacerbate this problem. The affordability crisis in this country is being fueled by this Liberal government. And now, with the NDP sharing the reins, it will lead to even higher taxes, more debt, and even less accountability. Canadians are being pushed to the brink, and Mr. Speaker, they need some relief. From cancelling the carbon tax increase, scrapping it entirely, or providing a GST holiday on gasoline and diesel, there are common sense solutions that can help Canadians today. Mr. Speaker, this NDP Liberal government needs to leave money where it belongs, and that's in the pockets of hardworking Canadians. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Milton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm proud to stand in the House today to acknowledge the extraordinary resilience and positivity of my neighbour in Milton, Erin Rigglesworth. Erin is 42, a wife to Eric, a mother to two awesome kids. She's an awesome school teacher, a very competitive runner, and a friend. And in December of 2020, she was diagnosed with breast cancer that has spread rapidly and has been deemed incurable. Since receiving this devastating news, Erin did what she always does, and she fought. She continues to undergo intense treatment at Princess Margaret Hospital, and the Erin's Army GoFundMe has raised close to $25,000. Wow. And they've pledged to any money that's left over once she's healthy and cured will be donated to cancer research. Amazing. This is a reminder that even in the face of unimaginable heartbreak, there remains great power and hope that bravery can inspire us all. 
My thoughts continue to be with Erin and her family and friends, and I want her to know that her heroic example, while incredibly difficult, has inspired so many. All of my neighbours in Milton and so many more across this country are with you, and we're proud soldiers on Erin's army. Erin, keep fighting. We're with you. The Honourable Member for London Fanshawe. Canada continue to face an increase in gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. Pleas from women's organizations have gone unanswered and they have been told to wait for a national action plan that is now six years overdue. The crisis is now. In London, we have an amazing resource to support women called the NOVA that provides shelter, support, counseling and resources for abused women. They have said that because of the lack of beds, they have had to turn away women almost 1,800 times last year, wow. while also seeing an increase of over 53% in gender-based violence. The federal government needs to establish sustainable annual core funding. They need to establish survivor-centered changes to the justice system and invest in long-term housing for women fleeing violence. We must face gender-based violence head-on, but these amazing women's organizations on the front line can't do it alone. They need the government to reject austerity measures, move beyond planning, and to finally deliver action and the dollars they need to save lives. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. The Honourable Member for Pierre Boucher, Les Patriotes Vercher. Mr. Speaker, on March 11th, Quebec and Valenne lost one of the greats, the actor Yves Trudel. While most Quebecers will remember him for his role as Mayo, for his family and friends, he was a man of integrity, erudite and intelligent. His dramatic arts students in particular benefited from his teachings. An incorrigible joker, he never missed an opportunity to make you a bit uncomfortable to test your perspicacity. His role as Bob Graton touched us as Quebecers and made us laugh. Seeing him as the bumbling mechanic with his ever-present cigar and his famous skidoo toque is now part of our collective memory in Quebec. Beyond the jokes and the caricatures, it's important to remember that the goal of the character was to illustrate the Quebec condition and to remind us of the importance of fighting for our identity, our culture and our national emancipation. To the patriot Yves Trudel, thank you. Thank you for Mayo. Thank you from Quebec. The Honourable Member for Regina Louvain. Mr. Speaker, a majority mandate is won by crisscrossing the country, listening to Canadians and earning their trust at the polls. People in Regina Louvain are in disbelief that the Prime Minister has created his own majority mandate in the shadowy back rooms of Ottawa. Canadians are upset and sending a clear message. They did not vote for an NDP Liberal government. Now that the ink is dry on the official agreement, the NDP can stop pretending this dangerous coalition has not existed for years. People want answers. The Prime Minister needs to come clean on how much his majority will cost Canadians. How much did it cost for the member of Burnaby South to once again sell out his party's principles? Mr. Speaker, this NDP Liberal government will be the most reckless and expensive in our country's history. People in Regina Louvain are already paying too much for everyday essentials like food and fuel. And with the Prime Minister's deceptive deal, that pain is only going to get worse for Canadians. Yep. Wow. The Honourable Member for Longueuil, Charles Lemoyne. Mr. Speaker, it's very difficult for all of us to look at the terrible images we're seeing from Ukraine. And I know that this is particularly true for the members of the Canadian Armed Forces and their families. As the mother of a son who was deployed to Ukraine under Operation Unifier, I know firsthand the incredible role that our Canadian Armed Forces have played in helping the Ukrainian Defence Forces prepare for this moment when they are fighting for the defence of their country. Canadians are both horrified by the senseless violence that we've seen from Ukraine and also inspired by the determination of the Ukrainian army and the people of Ukraine. As they defend their country, Canada stands in solidarity with the people of Ukraine and with their courageous president, and we will continue to be there for them. Thank you to the members of the Canadian Armed Forces. Thank you. Questions, question oral, the official, the honourable leader of the official opposition.
Canadians were shocked to find out that they are now being governed by an NDP Liberal coalition government. An alliance of high tax, high spend and extreme ideology proponents. But what Canadians don't know is what are the details of the agreement. Now we did see a press release yesterday but that was all. So I'm wondering Mr. Speaker, is there a signed agreement between the... C'était quelque chose de la traduction se fasse pas. Non, pour tout le début de la phrase. Okay. So la traduction se pas. There was no interpretation for the very beginning. The translation will get moving. Is there a translation happening here at the same time? Translation. I'll have the I'll have the leader uh, start to start a question again. The honor the honorable leader of the official opposition. saying Canadians were shocked to find out they are being governed by an NDP Liberal coalition government, an alliance of high tax, high spend and extreme ideology proponents. But Mr. Speaker, what Canadians don't know are what are the details of this agreement. We saw a press release yesterday, but no actual details. Is there a signed agreement between the Liberals and the NDP and will they make it public? Yes or no? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, and it was clear in the last election what Canadians wanted as a priority. Uh, action on growing the economy, uh, expanding the middle class and making sure that people can join. Uh, making sure that we have affordable uh, child care, that we expand health care services. Uh, and all of these things are at the core of what, when we came to power six months ago, we said we wanted to work with other parties on. Now, I know because I was there when the Conservatives were in a minority government, they didn't work with other parties. It's an unusual concept for them. But there's the opportunity that they have today to work collaboratively in Parliament to get things done. That's our objective. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. Mr. Speaker, there is a signed agreement somewhere that they are hiding. Part of the deal struck by the Liberals and NDP creates a new executive committee of the government. This secret committee is made up of NDP and Liberal members and it excludes the opposition. That is an executive committee of government. So who is on that executive committee? And again, will the Liberals and the NDP make this agreement public for Canadians and for this House? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, there is every opportunity for us to all work together, and I think that that is exactly the spirit that was expected after the last election. The Canadians wanted to see stability. They wanted to see results. They wanted to see us focus on getting things done. And as the member uh, will well know, uh, we continue to have worked together on a great number of issues, and that opportunity will continue in the future. Uh, but what this means is that Parliament can have stability, that yes, we have differences, and some of those differences are very big, but that doesn't mean that we should put our partisan differences in front of getting the business of the nation done, and that's what this deal is about. The Honourable Leader of the Official Opposition. High tax, high spend and higher cost for everything is all that this NDP Liberal government will be delivering for Canadians. This backroom secret deal will cost Canadians an additional $200 billion and that's not even counting the April 1st tax hike that is coming. Risky social experiments are not what Canadians need. They need their rent paid, they need food in their fridge, they need gas in their tanks. Will the Prime Minister tell Canadians how much this nightmare of a socialist secret deal will cost Canadians? The Honourable Government House Leader. Well, Mr. Speaker, I was there for three uh, minority governments with Stephen Harper, and what we saw was a complete railroading of the opposition, no interest in working with other parties. And not only that, we saw the most stagnant, dead economic growth the country had seen over that period of time uh, that we had seen uh, historically. And what we've seen now uh, is Canada leading, leading in economic growth, leading in job creation, leading in climate action. And what we're focused on, Mr. Speaker, is working with any party that is willing to work with us to get the business of the nation done. So I would suggest to the Conservatives, there's an opportunity, break from their usual mold, which is attack, attack, attack. <laughs> The Honourable Member for Megantic l'érable Mr. Speaker, this NDP Liberal Prime Minister 
has repeatedly demonstrated his lack of respect for our parliament. We learned that behind closed doors, he created parallel secret committees to manage budgets, the work of the House and committees, and even bills. These secret committees will have the power to decide whether to tax Canadians, spend, run deficits, and impose decisions on the provinces. Will this NDP Liberal Prime Minister and his coalition Deputy, Deputy Prime Minister reveal who the MPs will be on these committees as well as this agreement? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, it's a bit rich to hear the Conservatives talk about lacking respect for Parliament. They were the ones who wrote a book about how to vandalize House of Commons committees when they were in power. Mr. Speaker, we have been clear. Canadians elected a minority parliament, and they want MPs to collaborate. I know that may be shocking to the Conservatives, but that's exactly what we will do in the interest of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Mégantic-Lérable. All right, let's discuss the last elections. 90% of Quebecers rejected the NDP, and its expenses during the last election and the ink has barely dried on the agreement before the Premier of Quebec said that, that it won't be so easy for this coalition to negotiate with Quebec. How can this coalition support such an agreement at the expense of Quebec jurisdiction? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Conservatives spend so much time arguing between themselves that they are not capable of fathoming the concept of an agreement between two parties. For them, an agreement between parties is like climate change. It doesn't exist, Mr. Speaker. It's not a thing. What we want is stability to deliver for Quebecers and Canadians. And that's something that the Conservatives just can't understand. The Honourable Member for La Prairie, Mr. Speaker, Quebec will not let this neoliberal coalition weaken its powers and its capacity to make its own choices as a nation. All the parties in the Quebec National Assembly agree, whether it be health, housing, early childhood, or other things. It's Quebec jurisdiction. According to the Premier of Quebec, we have two parties here that are very centralizing, the Liberal Party and the NDP, which want to impose their vision on all provinces. But it won't be that easy. Why does this new liberal coalition why is it trying to argue with the provinces instead of collaborating respectfully? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, if we were looking to pick a fight, we would ask the Bloc Québécois to guide us. They are the ones who are experts at picking a fight. Mr. Speaker, I understand the Bloc Québécois' frustration. We were elected to this parliament to collaborate and to move forward the interests of all Canadians on issues as important as public health, housing, and so on. And that's exactly what we will do. Of course, while respecting provincial jurisdiction, that is what I do every day in my work as a minister, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for La Prairie. Mr. Speaker, when you're the only one who is right, it's always because you're wrong. Once again, let's hear what the government of Quebec said. A lot of our revenues end up in the federal tax system. That money belongs to us. We have a right to it unconditionally and, used, and to use according to our needs. Mr. Speaker, that's what the Liberals and their Orange Farm team are forgetting. It's not their money. It's Quebecers' money. It belongs to them. And it's an area of Quebec jurisdiction. So with all this in mind, will they ensure that there is a right for withdrawal with full compensation? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, well, listen, the Black Quebec are the international champions of picking fights. They are the champions of that. They come here to fight with us. So how can we ask them to understand that some people want to work together? And so the fact that we want to sit down and talk about social housing, that's good for Quebec. Fighting climate change is good for Quebec. Helping workers is good for Quebec, but unfortunately, it's bad for the Bloc Québécois. The Honourable Member for North Island Power River. Mr. Speaker, costs keep going up. Housing, gas, groceries, and Canadians are struggling. P 
people are hurting while the ultra rich continue to get richer. Yesterday, the members of this house voted on a proposed tax to excess profits of those oil companies, big box stores, and banks who are getting richer off the backs of Canadians. When will this government take leadership and tax those who need to and stop taxing Canadians? The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I respect the Honourable Colleague for her question. And building a fairer and more inclusive economy that works for all Canadians has been a central focus for our government since we first took office, and we appreciate the NDP's intent behind this Opposition Day motion. But let's remember our record on supporting the middle class, providing more pandemic supports for Canadians and businesses in Bill C-2, stopping the Canada Child Benefit from going to millionaires in order to send more money to 9 out of 10 families, investments to combat international tax measures. We will keep focusing on affordability, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Rosemont la Petite Patrie. Mr. Speaker, a lot of people are suffering. People are feeling pain at the pump at a time when big oil companies are raking in rec record profits. Gr produce, meat, groceries in general are more and more expensive for families at a time when CEOs are bathing in their millions. It is time to ensure that these ultra rich people pay their fair share and that we use that money to help those who are struggling. When will the Liberals finally add a 3% pr tax on the excessive profits of those who are getting rich on the backs of the public? The Honourable Minister. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank my colleague for his question. Et plus juste. Building a fair and more affordable country, country for Canadians is part of our mandate as a government. We appreciate the spirit of the NDP motion yesterday, but we also need to note that we have made life more affordable for Canadians. We have raised our support for the Canada Child Benefit, we have raised taxes on the wealthy, and we have increased our investment in the CRA. So we will continue to make life more affordable for Canadians. Mission Mastery, Fraser Canyon. Mr. Speaker, at the end of 2021, Canadian home prices were 19% above the borrowing capacity of medium income households. By summer 2022, it is expected to reach a level that is 38% higher than what most borrowers can afford. This is despite the fact that this government has earmarked $72 billion for housing. When there are no real outcomes we can point to except an affordability crisis, why is this NDP Liberal government intent on spending Canadians into oblivion? The Honourable Minister of Housing. That party uh, in this House faces a leadership problem. They don't even have the term affordable housing in their plans. They vote against every measure that comes before this House to enable uh, Canadians to access their home. And I hope the Honourable Member talks to his colleague from Stormont Dundas, South Gary, who quote-unquote said our government should pull back from the national housing strategy. That same member said that we should stop the first-time home buy incentive. How dare they talk about home ownership when they want us to move back from that. The Honourable Member for South Shore, St. Margaret's. In the last two weeks, BC crab fishermen off Tofino have had 50% of their quota expropriated and given to others without compensation. Maritime elver fishermen had their quota expropriated and given away without compensation last week. Yay. The NDP Liberal marriage ceremony is over. The Tofino honeymoon is on. But it's the fishermen being hurt by the consummation of this marriage. Will they listen to the NDP government member from Courtney Alberni, who called on his government to fairly compensate fishermen for this expropriation? The Honourable Minister of Fisheries. Well, this would be great. Mr. Speaker. The neutral North nations are working collaboratively with our government to advance, and we are advancing reconciliation with them, uh, recognizing uh, their inherent right to fish. And as it is with the moderate livelihood rights, 
of uh, nations uh, with respect to the Elver. So we are working with industry uh, to negotiate solutions that are acceptable to all parties as we move forward with reconciliation obligations. The Honourable Member for Central Okanagan, Similkameen Nicola. Mr. Speaker, yesterday Conservatives came to Parliament to talk about giving Canadians a break from record high gas prices. Yesterday, the Prime Minister came to Parliament to talk about giving himself a break thanks to a backroom deal with the NDP. A GST cut at the pumps would help millions of Canadians struggling with the highest inflation levels in 30 years. As every Member of Parliament is hearing calls from constituents who want a break, will the Prime Minister allow a free vote for his MPs? And if so, will he extend the courtesy to his coalition partners in the NDP? The Honourable Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honourable Member for his question. Mr. Speaker, I filled up at the pumps last week and I understand the situation that Canadians are facing. As my colleague knows, the rising of the prices of the pumps is due to the tragic situation unfolding in Ukraine. The that. problem with the Conservative plan, Mr. Speaker, is that it wouldn't work. There's no guarantee that Canadians would see a reduction at the pumps. There's nothing to prevent gas companies from absorbing that cost. While the other side is fighting amongst itself to pick a leader, we're going to focus on affordability for Canadians. The Honourable Member for Carlton, Tra Carlton Trail, Eagle Creek. Putin's war machine is funded by Russian oil and gas production Absolutely. and exports. Ukrainians are suffering as a result. The NDP Liberal Agreement includes an ominous line about phasing out public financing for Canada's energy sector. This is music to Putin's ears. Absolutely. Will the NDP Liberal government support the expansion of Canada's ethical and environmentally responsible energy so it can replace Putin's oil and gas around the world. Good question. The Honourable Minister. For her question. Uh, as she knows, we've announced the uh, Government of Canada will ban crude oil imports from Russia until further notice. She also knows that according to the Canada Energy Regulator over the last couple of years, Canada's imported very little crude uh, oil from Russia at all. Uh, we also realize the impact that this is having around the world, and we are working with our counterparts, and we will do what we need to do to ensure that Can Canadians are protected and that we support the people of Ukraine. The Honourable Member for Tobik Maktaquak. Mr. Speaker, the carbon tax is a punitive, ineffective and unnecessary tax that disproportionately hurts rural and small town Canadians, including seniors. Whether it's the rising cost of living, soaring inflation, interest rates hikes, $2 a litre gasoline or an average home cost doubling, Canadians are feeling the pain and they're needing relief now. Mr. Speaker, with this new NDP Liberal government cooked up in the back rooms, how much more pain can Canadians expect at the pump? grocery stores and in their pocketbooks. The Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Mr. Speaker, we all know that putting a price on carbon is one of the most effective ways to reduce emissions. And if they, won't, if they won't take it for the Parliamentary Budget Officer or the International Monetary Funds, maybe... Ma <laughs> now, order. I'll have order. Let the minister respond. I will let him restart. Thank you kindly, Mr. Speaker. As we all know, putting a price on carbon is one of the most effective ways of fighting climate change. And if the Conservative won't take it from the Parliamentary Budget Officer or the International Monetary Fund, then maybe they will take it from the member from New Brunswick Southwest who asked his own province, the Conservative member for, for New Brunswick Southwest, who asked his own province to implement the federal pricing system, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. L'honorable député de Levy. The Honourable Member for Levy Lobinière. Mr. Speaker, this new NDP Liberal government is concerning, especially when it comes to the next four budgets. Canadians are struggling every day to make ends, be ends meet. Mr. Speaker, 
Can the Prime Minister tell us if the new colors of the new Liberal NDP party, orange and red, represent what Canadians will shortly be experiencing? Hellish suffering. The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to thank my very passionate colleague for his question. Let's look at the facts. On this side of the House, we have recuperated 112% of the jobs lost during the pandemic. We have introduced a child care benefit to help families. We have offered more support to seniors. We have increased the Canada Child Benefit. And at the same time as the Conservatives are arguing among themselves and trying to find a new leader, we will be helping all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Jonquière. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday, the government of Quebec tabled its budget. It announced that it will lack $6 billion in the health area every year because the federal government is not doing its part. And it's reiterating the message, taking a fight, supposedly, that all the provinces have been saying for two years, that we need to raise health transfers unconditionally to 35% of costs. That's what all premiers are asking for, and they want the government to negotiate. If the federal government can find the time to negotiate with the NDP, will it find time to negotiate with the provinces? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm very pleased to answer that question. I would also like to remind us that $73 billion was used to support health and, and safety for all Canadians, including Quebecers in addition to the $45 billion made through the Canada Health Transfer, which will be increasing, as well as the $4 billion we announced last year to address delays in various medical procedures, and sank billion dollars additionally that were invested over the last few years. And if there are more questions, I have more to add. The Honourable Member for Montcalm. Mr. Speaker, everyone is asking for health care transfers to be increased unconditionally. It's completely unanimous. Quebec, all of the provinces, Liberal, NDP or Conservative, all of them, without exception, want health transfers to be increased. That's a consensus, Mr. Speaker. When you decide to go against a unanimous consensus, I'm sorry to say it, but you're the one who's picking a fight. So I'd like to ask the government and its Orange Farm team, why is it trying to pick a fight instead of joining the consensus and increasing health care transfers unconditionally? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, the Bloc Québécois is asking for transfers, and we are sending transfers. $3 billion announced in the last budget to support the health and dignity of our seniors in long-term care centres in Quebec and elsewhere. $1 billion to help the provinces and territories to implement vaccination programs, 300 million to help the provinces pay for the vaccine passport systems that they've been using very, very effectively recently. And I have even more to add. For Kelowna Lake Country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are two tax increases happening on April 1st, excise tax and carbon tax. The carbon tax will basically increase the cost of anything shipped or heated, and both will add to the 5.7% inflation. People can't keep up. And yet yesterday, the Associate Finance Minister said a temporary pause on taxes won't help Canadians at the pumps. As other jurisdictions have, will the NDP Liberal Prime Minister have some empathy for Canadian families and small businesses, do the math, and cancel the April Fool's Day carbon tax increase? The Honourable Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for her question. And we understand the affordability challenge that Canadians are facing. Let us remember that inflation is a global phenomenon, that energy prices, supply, supply shocks, the war on Ukraine is causing prices to rise. On this side of the House, we will keep focusing on affordability. And without our fiscal prudence, Canada's GDP would have declined by eight further points. The unemployment rate would have risen by another 3.2 percentage points, and we would not have recovered over 3 million jobs lost at the height of the pandemic. The Honourable Member for Bose. Mr. Speaker, the cost of living crisis is affecting people in Bose every day. Inflation is at record levels, and Canadians are having trouble making ends meet. 
Right now in Bose, gas costs nearly 180 a liter. In my riding, we don't have the luxury of public transit, so there's even more of an impact. Will this NDP Liberal government vote with us after QP to eliminate GST in order to help people and small businesses to get their lives back on track? The Honourable Minister, Mr. Speaker, I would like to thank my colleague for his question. We know that Canadians are facing an increase in gas prices. As my colleague knows, energy prices are going up because of the tragic war in Ukraine. We also know that the Conservative plan would not work, Mr. Speaker, because there is no guarantee that reducing GST would be transferred to consumers. On this side of the House, we will focus on real solutions, not on bizarre Conservative suggestions. Honourable Member for Brantford Brant. Mr. Speaker, we all know who is hurting the economy the most. The Prime Minister, his Liberal government, and now with blind support from the NDP. They have spent the most to achieve the least and have no intention to balance the budget. Since this government was first elected, our great country is gradually losing its wealth and Canada's middle class is shrinking. Now their failure to control spending drives the cost of living to record heights. When will this NDP Liberal government give Canadians a break and cancel the planned tax increases on April the 1st? The Honourable Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance. Mr. Speaker, I thank my Honourable Member for his question. Let us set forth some facts. $511 billion invested in Canadians during the height of the pandemic. Three million jobs and more recovered since the height of the pandemic. The inflation that we are experiencing is a global phenomenon. We will keep focusing on affordability. While the Canadians fight amongst themselves to pick a leader, we're going to focus on Canadians and putting more money in their pockets. The Honourable Member for Calgary Rocky Ridge. Mr. Speaker, this government is presiding over Canada's highest inflation rate in a generation, fueled by structural deficits that were baked in before COVID, out of control spending, monetary expansion, and an ever increasing carbon tax. The Bank of Canada recently confirmed that the carbon tax alone is responsible for driving up inflation by nearly half a percent. Will this NDP Liberal government commit today? to cancel this year's carbon tax increase and give consumers a break. The Honourable Minister of Environment. Speaker, speaking of giving Canadians a break, come provinces where the pr carbon pricing is being applied by the federal government. In Ontario, households will receive $745. In Manitoba, $830. In Saskatchewan, $1,100, Mr. Speaker, and almost as much in Alberta. The, the, the carbon pricing is working for Canadians and to reduce emissions, where the Conservatives have no plan whatsoever to fight climate change, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Vancouver East. Over 3.6 million people have fled Putin's destruction in Ukraine and are desperately trying to unite with friends and family and find safety, including here in Canada. Even though older identity documents are supposed to be recognized in the fast-tracked visa process, Ukrainians with an older internal passport are unable to complete the government's online application process. My constituent is having a hard time getting a visa for his 83-year-old mother. Will the minister take swift action to ensure older identity documents are recognized through the government's online emergency visa application process? The Honourable Minister of Immigration. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I thank the Honourable Member for her question and for her sincere concern for the well-being of those who are fleeing unimaginable circumstances in Ukraine. We've now seen more than 10,000 Ukrainians arrive in Canada since the beginning of this calendar year, and we're going to continue to do more to promote and facilitate the safe transport of people to Canada as quickly as possible. With respect to outdated travel documents, we contemplated this possibility during the program design and are working to issue single journey travel documents for those who do not have a valid passport. I would be pleased to continue to work with any member of this house who identifies problems along the way, because as this system develops for the first time, we want to make sure it continues to operate smoothly to welcome as many people here as quickly as possible. Thank you. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Mr. Speaker, Ukrainians are fleeing the horrific attacks in their country and they are vulnerable. They are seniors, they are mothers with children. 
The open work permit won't help these people because they may not be able to work. Mothers will need access to daycare and they will need money to pay for it. In many cases, they may not want to leave their children who have been deeply traumatized. Canada must provide air and ground transportation to help Ukrainians get to Canada and then support them when they're here. This is mm -hmm. urgent. Will the minister commit immediately to financial support for Ukrainians when they arrive in Canada? The Honourable Mim Minister of Immigration. Uh, Mr. Speaker, again, I'd like to thank this uh, member for her advocacy for the well-being of those fleeing Ukraine as well. Uh, with respect, uh, her point in uh, regarding the open work permit, uh, I, I would like to uh, point out that nearly 80% of those who've applied to come through the Canada-Ukraine authorization for emergency travel have also applied for the open work permit that we've made them eligible for. With respect to supports for people in terms of getting here and once they land, we're working right now with nonprofit partners, with private sector donors, with airlines to sort out some of the very issues that she's raised in her question. We are working around the clock across ministries with partners in provincial jurisdictions and on the ground in Canadian communities so we can maximize the extraordinary goodwill we are seeing coming from Canadians who want to do their part. Member for Scarborough Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, rising inflation is presenting real challenges for my constituents in Scarborough Centre, especially seniors on fixed incomes and families with young children, already challenged by high housing prices. The rising cost of groceries and other daily necessities is making it harder for families to put healthy and nutritious food on the table for their children. Could the Associate Minister of Finance please tell us what the government is doing to help these families having to make difficult choices between healthy food and paying rent? The Honourable Minister of Tourism and Associate Minister of Finance. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank my honourable colleague from Scarborough Centre for her exceptional work on this file. Thanks to the historic investments in Budget 21, and thanks to the incredible work of the Minister of Families, Children and Social Development, we now have early learning and child care agreements with nine provinces and three territories. This means across the country, Canadians are already saving over $5,000 a year. Savings for family in BC, in Nova Scotia, in Manitoba, in Newfoundland and Labrador, and in my own province of Alberta. We continue to work hard every day to make high-quality child care affordable for all Canadians. The Honourable Member for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. Mr. Speaker, Canadians who choose to join Ukraine's foreign legion would do so at great risk for themselves. They should not have to worry about prosecution in Canada. According to the Foreign Enlistment Act, it is against the law for a Canadian to fight against a friendly foreign state, but the Act contains no definition or list regarding who is a friendly foreign state. So could the Attorney General simply clearly state for the purposes of this Act that Russia is not considered a friendly foreign state? <laughs> The Honourable Minister of Foreign Affairs. Mr. Speaker, obviously we know that Ukraine is at war and that we need to make sure that we help Ukraine to defend itself. Now, I've been clear uh, and the travel advisory on Canada's website is clear. We need to make sure that if people are in Ukraine, they need to shelter. And at the same time, we've been clear since February 1st that should Canadians be in Ukraine, they should be leaving the country. And we've been clear also that Canadians should not go to Ukraine. That being said, we know that this is a personal choice on the part of uh, many Canadians, and I look forward to working with my colleague on this issue. Thank you. Honourable Member for Sherwood Park for Saskatchewan. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I hope we'll get some clarity at some point on that specific question. Now, a defining challenge for democracies in many parts of the world is energy security. Fueling democracy and protecting the international rules-based order requires Canada to step up and do our part uh, to help our partners kick Putin's gas out of their supply yes. chains. Does the NDP Liberal government recognize that supplying energy to fellow democracies is critical for global security? Yes. The Honourable Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The current situation in Ukraine underscores the importance of energy security of our allies in Europe and around the world. Our country is in a secure position in terms of energy supply, and as Europe works to address the geopolitical and social economic challenges presented by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we are considering all measures to preserve energy supply chains in Canada and, where possible, worldwide. 
The Honourable Member for Edmonton West. Mr. Speaker, in Operations Committee, Public Works admitted that the government might delay the selection of a replacement fighter jet for an additional 12 months, because apparently six years delay is not enough. <laughs> now, when we asked Public Works if they'd received any directions from the Liberal NDP government to speed up the process in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the answer was a simple, nope. Wow. So what is this government's plan for our Air Force in this time of crisis? Go shopping on eBay for more gently used CF 18s? <laughs> the Honourable Minister of Public Services and Procurement. I thank the member for the question. Our government has been strong and consistent in delivering on its promise to replace Canada's existing fighter jet fleet through an open, fair and transparent process. We are delivering real progress in purchasing 88 advanced fighter jets for our Canadian military. This is a rigorous assessment process. We're going to continue to support the Royal Canadian Air Force and their efforts to keep Canadians safe with equipment that meets their standards. And we're going to do this in a very responsible way. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for York Simcoe. Mr. Speaker, this Prime Minister likes to say Canada's back, but last week I was in Poland at the Ukrainian border and Canada was nowhere to be found. Mm, wow. Thousands of Ukrainian refugees are flooding through border towns like Medica, where they are given humanitarian aid from around the world, including countries as small as Uzbekistan. Other nations are doing their part. Canada has almost no presence on the ground. The only maple leaf you could find was the one on my jacket. Why is this Liberal NDP government offering no visible support to the Ukrainian people in their time of need? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker, I respectfully disagree with that. What the member, in fact, uh, myself and other members, we were actually on the ground as well, where I got to visit actually Poland, Moldova, Romania, and other countries as well. In fact, we actually not only have a team on the ground coordinating with USA, the EU, and the United Nations. We have been on a daily conversation to making sure that humanitarian support is is going getting to the right people. Thank you. The honourable member for Lac Saint Jean, Mr. Speaker. For four weeks now, the bloc has been working with the government to welcome Ukrainian refugees. But now we're fed up. It's unacceptable that the minister has not yet chartered flights to pick up refugee families. Air Transit has volunteered for the job, but they're just waiting for the minister to give them the green light. And there are other airlines that were bailed out with billions of dollars by this government. The minister could ask them to do their share. Will he finally pony up and in store at Airbridge this week? Of immigration. Canada offer you the Canada will offer you offer refuge to refugees. Canada has welcomed almost 10,000 Ukrainians, and last week we have announced measures to help Ukrainians to come to Canada easier, and this is safely. Not just to give them permission to apply to Canada, but to do what we can to facilitate their arrival. We're having conversations in real time with private sector players, with provinces and territories, and others who can facilitate their arrival in Canada as quickly as possible. I'm going to continue my work on this file until we see additional Ukrainians come beyond the 10,000 who have already arrived. The Honourable Member for Lac Saint Jean. Mr. Speaker, that answer is no longer acceptable. For the minister to give this House a hollow answer, that's one thing, we're used to it. But for him to give a hollow answer to Ukrainian women and their children who are stuck in Poland without a penny in their pockets, that's something else. The minister has no right to tell refugees that Canada will help them and then tell them, get out of there on your own. When is the minister going to make a deal with the airlines? When? The Honourable Minister. Mr. Speaker would dare suggest that it's not a hollow answer to the 10,000 Ukrainians who are already in Canada or the tens of thousands of more who've applied or will be welcomed to Canada in the future. We are having these conversations in real time, including with airlines, including with provinces and territories, including with private sector contributors, including with service providers on the ground. We will work every day to do everything we can to help the people who are fleeing this war. It is the just and honourable thing to do when we're dealing with such a war of aggression. Canada will its play its part, including by welcoming as many uh, Ukrainians who are fleeing this war of aggression as possible. The Honourable Member for belchasse les aides chemin levy Mr. Speaker, the Liberal government was so preoccupied with wrapping up its alliance with the NDP secretly that it forgot to lift health measures like other G7 countries are doing. Vigilance does not mean rigidity 
or stubbornness. When will the government, this neoliberal government, reevaluate the remaining federal, federal measures? The Honorable Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This will allow me to thank, like we'd all like to do every day, the 30 million Canadians who did get vaccinated over the past year. We're talking about millions of doses that were administered by thousands of healthcare workers, people who went out and got vaccinated, and they also protected those who are around them. Some members on the Conservative side are not wearing their mask, and it a politician can't tell us when COVID-19 will end. Burford, Saskatoon West. You're not Mr. Speaker, to call somebody else. Canada is a tale of two governments. Provincial governments use real science to make decisions and have lifted their COVID mandates. But here in Ottawa, the NDP Liberal government relies on political science and refuses to end COVID mandates, making some Canadians second-class citizens. These Canadians can't fly, they can't cross an international border or keep their job in the military simply because they don't want a voluntary vaccine. Mr. Speaker, when will the NDP Liberal government follow the lead of the provincial governments, listen to the science and end the federal COVID mandates? Here, here. The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And based on the earlier congratulations and thank you to Canadians, let me point to one more number. 135,000. That's the number of avoidable deaths that we saw in the United States over the last few months. Avoidable because they would have been avoided if Americans had done as well as we did in Canada, that is to vaccinate everywhere. 135,000 people dying in the U.S. because of not having been vaccinated as we did in Canada. I think it's a good way to, again, to signal our gratefulness to all those Canadians who did the right thing. The Honourable Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. O'Hearn is a 79-year-old senior living in Hastings, Lennox and Addington. He desperately wants to visit his grandchildren in the U.S. But there's a problem. He doesn't have a computer, a cell phone, nor an email address. He has no ability to comply with the Canadian Border Service Agency's Arrive Can requirement. Mr. Speaker, why is this NDP Liberal government not supporting fully vaccinated Canadians like Mr. O'Hearn and thousands of other Canadians? The Honourable Minister of Health. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And since I'm, I like numbers, and since I believe the opposition also likes science and, and, and numbers, let me quote two more, $1,604 billion. The fact that we had, in the last few months, vaccination mandates at the federal and provincial level made Canadians avoid 1,600 1, deaths. No, uh, 1,600 people who are now alive, living with their families, enjoying time with their friends, working, no, just living, and $4 billion of cost that were averted because of that. Order. Now we'd like to hear the answers as well. The Honourable Member for Sudbury. Mr. Speaker. Our government understands how important it is to support our young people earlier in their, in their careers. This is especially true when it comes to the next generation of farmers. Can the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture inform us what the government is doing to support knowledge transfer and engage the young people who will shape the future of agriculture? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I'd like to thank the member for her hard work and her writing. The next generation of farmers is indeed critical to the prosperity of this sector, and it's very important that we support them. I'm pleased to say that yesterday we announced the new group of young talent that will be participating in the Next Gen Agricultural Mentorship Program in Saskatchewan. Young Canadians are the ones who will shape the future of agriculture, and we all have a stake in their learning from experienced mentors. Through the Next Gen program, our government is supporting knowledge transfer to put the next generation of farmers on the right track to successful careers. The Honourable Member for Caribou, Prince George. Here, here. Mr. Speaker, last fall, fall, terror struck my community of Vanderhoof. A lone gunman hunted 
and opened fire on RCMP. He unloaded over 20 rounds into our detachment. The mental and emotional trauma that day still remains. These are men and women from across all backgrounds who believe in our country and our laws so much so that they put their lives in jeopardy each and every day. Yet, unbelievably, to this day, five months later, shamefully, no one from the federal government or the Minister of Public Safety has reached out to see if they're okay. Can the Prime Minister please comment and tell us why he refuses and ignores our community? Good question. The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary. I'd like to extend to the Honourable Member my, my condolences and every member in this House who thank the RCMP members who go to work every day to protect Canadians, to keep us safe. No one should go to work and not expect to come home safely. I appreciate his, his uh, comments in the House today and we'll follow up with him. The Honourable Member for Dufferin Caledon. Mr. Speaker, the NDP Liberal carbon tax is hurting rural Canadians. I mean, I hear that every single day. Lori, in my riding, says she feels like she's freezing because she has to keep the temperature so low in her home because she can't afford the cost of propane with the carbon tax on top. I'm glad the members across think that that's so funny that Lori keeps the temperature so low. It's the kind of answer and response we get from a government that has absolute disdain yes. for people that vote follow their ideological view. Exactly will they cancel this increase or will they tell Lori just to keep freezing? The Honourable Minister of Environment and Climate Change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Climate change and the cost of inaction is enormous, as many, many members from the Conservative Party stood in this House when there were floodings in BC or heat waves saying, What should we do about climate change? We are acting, Mr. Speaker, on climate change. Order. Order. Let the minister answer the question. Honourable Minister of Environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. How many members from the Conservative Party stood in this House after the floodings in BC, the heat domes that killed so many Canadians and said, we have to act on climate change? This is exactly what we're doing. And in fact, the revenue from pricing pollution will go back to provinces where the money was raised, 90% to families directly and 10% to businesses, municipalities, schools, hospitals, and Indigenous community. Under our plan, eight out of ten families will have more money in their pockets, Mr. Speaker, no matter what they say about it. The Honourable Member for Chatham, Kent Leamington. Labour shortages in agriculture and food processing have caused over $3 billion in lost sales. In Chatham, Kent Leamington, and actually right across this country, farmers and food manufacturers use temporary foreign workers when Canadians don't apply to fill these vacancies. The industry asked for an emergency worker program which builds on existing programs, requires no new spending, no new legislation. Mr. Speaker, how many more billions will the industry have to lose before this NDP government, Liberal government, acts? The Honourable Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture. Speaker, and I, I, I want to thank my honourable colleague for his question. We have the pleasure of working together on the Standing Committee of Agriculture, and we know how important temporary foreign workers are to our farmers in Canada, and especially in, our, in planting season when it's coming along. We are working on a solution. We've committed to a trusted employer program, and hopefully we'll get some, soon, some news very shortly. Thank you. The honourable member for Bonavista, Buren Trinity. Mr. Speaker. Reducing wait times for veterans has been our government's top priority. We're making progress, but we know that too many veterans still wait too long to get their claims processed by Veterans Affairs. Can the Minister of Veterans Affairs update us on what our government is doing to reduce wait times and provide faster service to Canadian veterans? Honourable Minister of Veterans. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to uh, thank my honourable colleague for this very important question. It is true that our investment of over two, of un, around $200 million has reduced the backlog by 40 per cent. But we're fully aware that's not good enough, so that's why we invested another $140 million to make sure that we have the vital staff in place to make sure we continue to reduce the backlog. 
My colleague is well aware that we invested $11 billion for programs and services for our veterans, and we as a government will continue to make sure we serve our veterans properly. Thank you, Mr. Bravo. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Port Moody to Quicklam. Mr. Speaker, over one million people with disabilities live in poverty in Canada, and they feel abandoned by this Liberal government. They face costs like medical expenses, specialized equipment, and adaptations to housing that is not universally designed. They deserve, deserve support to live in dignity. In six years, the Liberals have yet to table a bill that will finally deliver the support they need. Mr. Speaker, my question is this. When will the Liberals table a Canada Disability Benefit Act that lifts Canadians with disabilities out of poverty? The Honourable Minister. Very important question. No one should live in poverty, and far too many Canadians with disabilities do. Since 2015, we've taken historic steps towards building a disability-inclusive Canada. And we've learned that the lives of persons with disabilities have also been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. We are committed to reintroduce legislation to establish a new Canada disability benefit that will address the long-standing financial hardship felt by persons with disabilities. And I look forward to working with the member opposite to achieve that goal. The Honourable Member for Spadina for York. Mr. Speaker, on January 28th, the Minister of Housing and Diversity and Inclusion announced the government's intention to appoint a special representative on combating Islamophobia. Last week, on March 19th, Canadians saw yet again another attack, this time at a mosque in the GTA. Mr. Speaker, we remember Quebec City. We remember London. Racism is alive and well in Canada, and more must be done to combat it. Can the minister inform this House when will the special representative be appointed? The Honourable Minister. Uh, I want to thank the Honourable Member for his important question. On this side of the House, Mr. Speaker, we acknowledge the reality of Islamophobia in Canada. That is why we've taken concrete steps, including marking January 29th as the National Day of Remembrance and Action Against Islamophobia and holding a national summit on Islamophobia. We've provided significant resources to community organizations fighting Islamophobia on the ground, and we are committed to moving, to moving forward to appoint a special representative to combat Islamophobia. On this side of the House, I want to reassure the honorable member that we will stand with Muslim Canadians every, every, all along the way to make sure that we end Islamophobia once and for all, Mr. Speaker. Good job. Good job. Well, there you go. That's all the time we have for question period today. We have a point of order, a point of order for the Honourable Member for Mission Masquee, Fraser Canyon. Mr. Mr. Speaker, it dismays me that I need to stand again and uh, raise a point of order. The uh, Honourable Member, uh, Minister Responsible for Housing, stated again that there was no mention of affordable housing in the Conservative platform for the last election. I'm seeking unanimous consent, Mr. Speaker, to table that plan and outline that we it's did have a plan, plan to address affordability. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Does he have leave to table? There you go. Um, I think that the Honourable Member for Bertie Masquinonger has a point of order. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, there has been consultation amongst the parties, and I believe that if you seek it, you will find that there is unanimous consent to retable the following motion, that this House 